that is uh first of all i really want to thank you guys for always like going along with my inappropriate questions and answering <laughs> and answering them open-heartedly so uh today i want to talk about um what is our relationship with the natural cycles of life like like birth life and death and and how this has um so many uh metaphors and applications to everything we're doing in life and we were discussing um the duration of roles and of responsibilities and of uh, occupying certain positions and how sometimes things come to an end and sometimes other things have a, a bright beginning and then sometimes the going along part like the middle is super nurturing or super hard to carry so how um yeah just a reflection of how how are we dealing uh in an individual level with with this cycles and especially to death that i feel like it's harder to talk about somehow taboo uh it's usually harder to end cycles than to begin new ones um and i'll pass to juan to start thanks Libby. um well i was thinking in this question and i would say that um life as i see it is a gift so it's like um something that we received um without even like asking for it and like uh we should um enjoy that gift because um like in the in the moment we we uh start living we also start our journey to death so um i i i have this phrase that i learned uh, recently i think in this group and is and it says like um like life is the universe experiencing itself from uh from your own point of view so i just think like how would the universe like uh would like would would like to be seen through my eyes and yeah i i try i that that's like um i being part of something really big that doesn't end just with with myself but it's like um being part of something bigger and trying to um look not only from from your own point of view but trying to look from a from a uh from a more um um broad po point of view yeah mm -hmm. that's like what i think and i will pass to mateo hey everyone um yeah that's one deep uh, question again <laughs> every every thursday uh, is the same with the deep questions and i like it but i will try to be very short in this one um i i try i encounter myself in many situations in life in my short uh, age that have told me that have told me in some cases that uh things tend to end, but the fact that they end is not a, a reason to not enjoy them or not grab the best of, of that uh, stage of life or whatever. So um, I believe that, uh, like in physics, if you want to put science to it, everything tends to go into chaos. But what can you do to to get some benefits for that chaos? And, and for me, that's life. Like, uh, there is a beautiful a mess in the all chaos that you are surrounded by, but you still can grab some beauty out of it. So that's eventually what what I try to define data. 
It's the ultimate chaos that you don't know, the unknown, complete unknown, but the, the journey that leads to it is the beautiful part of, of everything in the end. So I try to make myself like an agreement to, to say that uh, life is even more important than death, of course, but death should be like uh, always have it in mind. Uh, I, I'm not sure who was the philosopher that said uh, that philosophy is, uh, to study philosophy is to learn how to die. I think it was Montaigne, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. So I believe that that's completely true, and I try to, to live myself daily thinking uh, in that aspect. Yeah, I'll pass it to Santi. Thank you, Mateo. Well, that's not an easy question to answer. I think. The only thought I can give it is uh, a sentence from, not from me, from Steve Jobs, when he gave the speech at the evaluation at Stanford, I think it was 2007. And he's, uh, as I've been growing and getting older, uh, you, you realize how fast everything goes, especially you start realizing that the groups you hang around with are younger than yourself. You are you are not that young guy that you used to be. And life goes fast. And I would, I think, I tend to think, and I've always acted like this, but the older I get, the more I try to do it, is just enjoy and do whatever you want to do. Forget about working for someone else if you don't enjoy what you're doing. Just forget about everything just risk yourself and because the time you're living today is not going to be here tomorrow and and it's gone it's gone forever so and and when you're younger you don't realize on that and and material things don't matter at all it doesn't i don't care if i make a million two million or ten million in crypto i'm not going to enjoy it my kid is going to enjoy it i'm not going to be here to enjoy it with him so i don't give a shit i do whatever i like and I, and i'm and I'm doing what I like, what I love, what I enjoy. And that's, that's I, I think, I'm not afraid of death. I don't think that much. But I, I can tell you that I see it closer. Because the, as you get older, you get to see your friends when their parents passed away. And you start to realize that, you know, next generation is yours. <laughs> and and, uh, and you just... You just, it's, it's a natural thing. It, you, you feel it closer and closer and closer. It's nothing to get, to worry too much about, but you just feel it. So I just would tell everyone to just try to enjoy, do what they think they want to do. If that's uh, taking a sabbatical, just take it. If that's uh, working on something they, they've always wanted to work and just try it. Sometimes it's not easy, but if you don't try it, you're not going to know it. So that's my, that's my, way of thinking on and, and on taking life and that's what it's been for, for a few years. Uh, I'll pass it to Zeptimus here. Thanks, Andy. Wow, very tough question. Uh, yeah, when I start a relation, even if it's with a, a collective or a person or whatever, like my main idea is like, uh, like w during that cycle, like both parts are better than uh, we initialize. Like, yeah, b both persons grow, and yeah, that's the main idea. And related to death, yeah, it's kind of like I, I was talking with my my like I I was for example when I'm very focused doing work or whatever, and my sister was telling me, but yeah, but you're gonna die someday, and and I was like, ah, I don't want to believe in that because. Uh, like the, the medicine is advancing actually the medicine is advancing and my little sister is studying genetics and yeah who hell who knows we're gonna be live for 1000 years or, or not yeah we don't know and i i yeah i've been reading of like the death of the dead and yeah it's super interesting to me and yeah it's super interesting to me and yeah that's me uh, and i'll yeah. pass it to check Santi, what? Nothing. 
Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, can I? I've kind of gotten lost. With, what What was the first? Like, what was the actual question? Um. What is your relationship with the natural cycles of life, but especially with death? Um, I'm a very extreme person. Um, it's always, it's always all or nothing. It's kind of like always been that way. Um, uh, my first near death experience was I was uh, six years old on a horse and the saddle came off at high speeds and, uh, I damn near went under it and trampled the death. And, uh, a guy came out of nowhere and literally picked me up by my neck as I was about to touch the ground and picked me up, picked me up in midair and put me on the back of his saddle. And I looked back and saw the horse just trampled it to bits. And it was like this crazy moment when you're only like six years old. Um, and it was like, as I was going to the ground, time like stopped and everything really just like got very clear. And I didn't like at that moment, I didn't know what was going to happen. It was surreal. And then when I was like a lot, oh, so there was quite a few on the ranch, actually. I almost died quite a bit. Um, and then, uh, and then my adolescence was pretty insane. Like I, I was in my first major car when I was 14 and the car rolled like 14 times. And, uh, but we had our seatbelts on, uh, we, we got ran off the road and went over an overpass and like went down the ramp into like a gully. It was pretty insane, but everybody lived. Uh, but again, it was nuts. Like the whole car flipping over and over again and then roughnecking. I, I had another handful of times where I almost died, mainly because of my own fault. Um, and it just, it creates an opposite extreme, though. Like, I kind of like death. Like, I kind of like cheating death. And so I was always very adventurous. Because when, you, you know, you start experiencing it, you, you're kind of like, well, what's the big deal? Like, this is kind of fun. And then at the same time, it gives you this other aspect of life. Like, when I watched my mom die, it was... Uh, it was pretty excruciating. And then uh, you, you tend to like, and then all I would see like Kevin shot himself when we were 13 and uh, that was a trip. And uh, you, I just, I just developed these two giant extremes for, for loving life and then not fearing death. And it created a weird concept in the middle. Like I don't, it's been tough because when I had kids, I had to really like bring myself in. Cause like, I'm not scared of like doing things that I should be. So, and I had to start thinking about it differently because my choice isn't their choice and I have to make a better choice for them. So I had to find a balance in that lust and love for life and this thrill and excitement for death. And I didn't have it. I didn't have a balance at all. It was one or the other. Um, so my kids really gave me a, uh, I like, uh, it's not just balance. They like gave me an umbrella kind of like, they were like, dad, you need this if, if it's going to work. And, uh, it's, it was, it was really good. So like most things I don't, I don't really bat an eye at honestly, cause I can either love it or just let it go. Like this just kind of life. I don't know if that really answered the question, but that's how it is for me. Um, my kids really brought me the balance because I couldn't, I couldn't just be this wild supernova whenever I wanted. Um, I'm going to pass to Griff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I really like this, like, fear of death, like overcoming the fear of death point. I think uh, it's like the quality. Of, uh, one of the biggest problems I feel like we're stuck in is this, like, quality of life versus fear of death. You know, and trying to strike a balance between the two, it's a, it's a it's not an easy choice. Um, I tend to be like Jake, but I don't have any kids, so um, I don't have to pull myself back. I, I I really love this idea of simulation theory and that life is a video game. And if you could imagine yourself in a video game, you know, and like you're surrounded by zombies in this house, you know, like like in real life, you might just want to like cower under a table and just like, oh no. But in a video game, you grab the shotgun, you kick down the door and you start popping, you know, because it's like, this is what you're there for. This is life is presenting you an opportunity. You know, these aren't problems. And and like things change when you have that video game perspective. 
I, I don't know. I really, uh, I really like to embody that, but I think Jake makes a really good point. I don't have kids. So I think that might, you know, there's, there's not like so much to at risk and there's not people who depend on me. So it's a, it's kind of a different situation, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's a really weird thing. Cause like, I feel like the worst things that happen to you are generally the best things that happen to you, except for when someone dies. It's like the one exception that like, Oh, there's not really anything great about that. It's just the cycle. And it's like this opportunity to accept life is what it is. And then, um, you know, elevate above it however you want. I choose the video game perspective, but I think everyone has to deal with it in their own way. Uh, I'll pass it to Chewy. Um, well, I... I... I guess uh, uh, you could say I, I, I take uh, like a little bit of, of, of what you guys have uh, said. Like I, I can feel related to that. Um, it's actually a, um, um, an interesting question right now because uh, like this definition has, has changed, uh, I think, the past week. Um, my... Um, well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back home, um, tomorrow afternoon and, and back home, uh, my grandmother, uh, hasn't been, uh, staying at her house because, uh, well, it's a big house. My, my, my grandfather passed like, uh, um, six years ago, um, and well, when the whole pandemic started, like uh, after a couple of months, uh, my my family got together and 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 got her like an apartment in the like in in one of my aunt's uh, backyard. Um, so uh, she's not alone and and stuff like this. And 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 then she started like with this idea of renting out uh, her rooms. <laughs> so it's a. It's it's been it's been weird just like because I I grew up in 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 this house and uh, her next door neighbor uh, was um, uh, the grandmother of of uh, one of my best friends while I was growing up and the other day uh, uh, she just brought it up like uh, as as like so so like naturally that oh yeah and and since. Uh, my friend uh, Tere like passed away, and I was like, "What? Like, like she passed away?" And 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 uh, it was like out of nowhere, uh, like for me. And and I don't I don't know why. I don't know why because uh, that was her neighbor. But it just like I uh, it, it brought in like all of this like uh, yeah like a, a like awareness of of mortality. But you know, in in, in just like in a in a in a very like a uh, synchronized way with uh what I'm living in my personal life and 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 yeah it just like it it makes you uh like uh question it and and yeah it's just like you 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 take all of these things for for granted sometimes and and like uh yeah you just like you never know when uh like the the next day but it it also makes you not look uh, outside but also um uh, inside and well i i i i personally like like grew up uh uh catholic and and being mexican uh christianity in general is is something like very uh uh um you know like rooted in 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 our society and uh a thing that i can add is that uh Sometimes, like I've come across people of like uh, different like religions, and uh, myself not like a, 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 a practicing uh, like Catholic, but but also like I I, I just try to uh, have the same uh, conversation, you know, with 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 people like regardless of of their faith and like their differences. Uh, I guess there are like certain like approaches to every topic that you can have. And, and find like a balance with with everyone and like regarding death i i think that that there's no there that there's no like uh 
uh, wrong, you could say, or you, you can never go wrong if 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 you talk to people about what uh, you can feel. And if we have this awareness of of us being like a, um, in in matter and energy in a way, uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you you, you never know like after we die like uh, where where we go but whenever you like miss people uh you can you can like uh, also like feel their energy and like matter because uh it's it, it's pretty much the same just like going uh, back and forth and 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 in a way uh i think that like uh different like religions or faith could uh get the same uh, get get to the same conclusion so uh sometimes in 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 moments of like death and, and, and things like this, uh, people don't have much left, but uh, things that they can share with uh, other people. So, yeah, I guess uh, the, there's not a lot that I could say about death, but uh, I, I guess that the, I could add that uh, uh, it's, it's important to share when someone goes uh, through an experience like that. And, and sharing these ideas and impressions of death, I think it's... Uh, uh, yeah, it, it it should be more uh, normalized in a way. Yeah. I'll Thanks. pass it to... Uh, oh, sorry, leave it. Yeah, I was going to pass it for you, but go ahead. I'll pass it to uh, uh, Dergadas. I don't know if you went already. I'll just say that um, I've already had an experience of my life outside of this individual life. So the meaning uh, of s cyclical things, it's meaning to me personally, but it just feels to me like my pre-birth experience says that, you know, I was just interested in going back to the the place where all the cycles stop. And, and then they're like, yeah, but you got to have this whole life here. And I'm like, well, that sucks. You know, like, why do I got to do that? <laughs> so like, <laughs> why do I have to have these awful parents and live in this awful time with all this weird cyclical stuff happening. And I just, you know, um, so for me, I have a very different perspective on death. I, I have no fear of death at all because I don't identify as an individual person. So, <clears throat> and that was all kind of taught to me in that one pre-birth experience. So, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I mean, life and death are one, even as a river and the sea are one, you know, uh, for what it, and it's interesting. My favorite thing about um, the favorite area of the of this book called The Prophet is like, for what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And for what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless ties, that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered? And this is the thing which, you know, is basically the mission of my life. And is in many ways the uh, underlying motivation that I have about everything that I do with in every situation. I s seem to be this person now, so I, I have to do some things. <laughs> but my perspective is very much informed outside of all the cycles of life. And even though it seems like I'm in a cycle right now, I'm very much not attached to it and, and just kind of uh, playing in, in the whole thing. So um, <clears throat> I think I'll pass it to uh, Tam. really like what everyone's saying uh my day is so fast and then as soon as we hit soft gov it's like i have to stop and slow down and really think and every week it's the same thing and i'm enjoying like luxuriating in the slowness of this this hour i think i'd like to talk about it as death as a cycle where death is just the ending and things end and we have endings so that we can have beginnings and um, right, there's endings to the corporeal, our physical death, you know, the person that's was once there and isn't there anymore. And I think these are the diff most difficult things to let go of. Um, I've recently had a close family member OD, very young, and it's the kind of thing where you just can't, you know, like that letting go process can be so simple for many things, but for the senselessness of uh, a physical death to something so avoidable um, is hard to let go of, but letting go of things is how we create space for new things to take place. So, you know, physical deaths are very hard. Ideological endings, you know, changing something in your thinking so dramatically that it 
alters the direction of your life forever, uh, like a, a hard pivot in a different direction, or relationships ending, personal, professional relationships. And I think the ending is um, letting, like, f letting go of um, your your ties to whatever whatever that is and letting new spaces emerge for new thoughts and new relationships and it's these experiences that really make our lives rich um i think i'm going to stop there i'd like to welcome katie to her first soft gov meeting and uh, if she's comfortable speaking i'll pass to katie thank you and katie also on here suga comes from my last name masuga so you can call me Suga, Katie. Thank you, Tam. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, these have been amazing to hear what everyone's saying about about this. And I've, I've noticed some links, um, some similarities in, in some of them. Even so what Dergatus and, and Griff and I guess you say uh, Freedom Double Zero. I didn't get that, um, quite get how I say that. But um, Griff, what you were saying about the video game resonated because it made me think of being in a dream, like uh, same thing, lucid dreaming where you just, and also what uh, Dergatis was saying, where it's like you're playing a role, that life is playing a role, really. And so you can have, if you have that uh, detachment from it, you are able to seize it in a, in a more um, free manner, right? In a more perhaps <clears throat> ambitious, exciting manner. And somehow there's some similarities with that when you have those near-death experiences or something tragic happens to you and you're, you, you can detach yourself in order to see it from one of those outside perspectives. And um, for myself, it's, it's funny because I am a parent, but I am also one of those people who's a bit of a, who's, a, who's, who's detached or who's able to take the video game view of life. And that's been um, interesting as a parent to continue that and I think it makes me more ambitious and creative and so sometimes I do have to say oh as a parent am I being too wild uh, when I check myself with the communities around me and I'm so different so vastly I operate differently from them and I, I have to remind myself well no this is this is um, this is my path right to do it in this manner that I actually think is more freeing. It may also be more difficult, but somehow it's more uh, rewarding. And just one other thing I'd like to add is um, when I had something very difficult happen to me maybe 15 years ago, uh, one of the mantras I, I adopted at that time was um, taking turns living. I called it taking turns living. And <clears throat> that means that this is our turn to be alive, what we consider being in, this, in these life forms. It's our turn. And there have been millennia of other folks having had their turn to live, and there will be folks after us who have their turn to live. So we take turns living. It's our turn, and we do with it what we will. And yet, it's all connected we're all connected, right? This is one long sort of uh, trajectory or melange of lives taking turns living. It's something I call um, transcendent correspondence. So we can we can be connected to our pa to past, to futures, to lives behind us and lives in front of us. There's a wonderful. Um, if you're familiar with the American poet Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass, where he says um, something like, uh, men and women of a, of a hundred years hence, I am with you and know how it is. I am with you and know how it is. So our human experience, the idea for me to think that Walt Whitman was thinking of me 100, 150 years ago, this is transcendent correspondence, and to me, that's very um, reassuring and and warming and um, and exciting. So, I'll 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 leave it at that. Um, I'm not sure who who I who didn't go. So if I don't know, I guess do I pass it back to Griff? Oh, no. I, I can take it. Thanks, oh, Sugar. Okay, I'll pass it to you. Oh. 
I'm so oh, new. Yes. Yeah, you're so welcome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I'll pass it to Nate. I think uh, you're the last one. Yeah, uh, what a question. And I, I do like that uh, phrase, uh, taking turns living. That's really awesome. Um, I, you know, if for those of you that don't know, like um, my approach to uh, life and death came from kind of um, my profession, uh, uh, it, which is in geophysics and geology. Uh, is the first time I understood the magnitude of geologic time scales, um, and just kind of understanding that you know we all have, you know, we're, we're granted this little moment within the history of existence um, to do something with it, and um, what 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 we do decide to do, and uh, it. it, it it guides my relationship and almost everything I do. Um, and so uh, I choose to, you know, have altruism and empathy as my, my calling cards as, as this type of, uh, you know, laying the foundations for the, the people who are going to next have their turn in, in this life. Um, and so just kind of setting the foundations and knowing that everything that we do does establish those foundations and does change the trajectory of, uh, our species on this planet and the planet itself. Um, and so I think that understanding the magnitude of geologic time really had an impact on me. And, <clears throat> and like, like many of you, we've all had our, um, you know, our witness death in, in many, many different forms in different ways. And it's uh, never a great thing, but even their deaths have an impact in the way we approach our lives and approach each other. And so I think that's uh, really fascinating and I'll keep it brief and pass it on to you, Libby. Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I'm, it's really beautiful to hear all this, all these reflections and and I always like to to bring perspective from one thing to another and uh, create this correlations, uh, like Sugar was saying, and making the connections between things. And um, and I think it's really, first of all, it's like really special that we have. Uh, Space to talk about these things and that we always make sure to open space and to uh, make everyone feel comfortable because we're coming from uh, I mean we were we are all here we're all gonna die we shared this and why not talking about this there was one book that really changed my life when I was 15 that was the the book of um, uh, the Tibetan book of living and dying. And it talks so much about how people when they are near death or when situations are near death, uh, people feel so much like talking about it because it's so unknown. It's like, wow, what is there at the other side or what happens or what it's like the biggest question and and the more we avoid talking about this the more it creates anxiety and uh, not feeling like you belong and not feeling in your body and there's so much uh comfort and understanding of life and one another that can come just by talking about that and and then now bringing to a grounded um place that is the roles we have here and how we've, we have been energizing these roles and being part of this community in different ways. And it's always a challenge to give a definition to a role because we, we constantly change them by existing and by passing them along. So um, we have a few roles that are somehow uh, solidified that are the, the community stewards, the contributors, the subject matter experts, and the gravitons. So one thing, it started to come up 
when I was talking to Tem and Griff, and uh, we have these reflections with Atta about the community, about what has been going uh, well, uh, what we can improve. And uh, one of the, um, the questions with the offboarding of the stewards, for example, it's this uh, sensitive place of like, how, how come when someone no longer energizes a role, um, why is it so sentimental to talk about this death, to talk about the, the funeral of a role and to accept this as a passage to other things that are about to come and to the place where you're gonna put your energy in um, and make other things alive. So this is a, mostly an open conversation for us to start thinking about this. And um, and, and, and perhaps creating rituals, you know, like understanding like, oh, if this is difficult to deal with, um, how can we create a ritual for that? When does that end? So we thought of uh, every steward will be like for the lifelong of the token engineering commons known for their contributions. And uh, we can even have like a little like ancestor lineage of some sort. I don't know. We can have many ideas about that. But um, I just wanted to provide like a common understanding of what is each one of these roles and open for debate if um, someone doesn't think that's like that or if that's a block or, and I'm aware that we used most of this call to talk about this, but I think it's it's important. So um, the steward's role, uh, give, uh, Griff had a very brief and powerful definition that is the people in the know. So if you know everything that is going on in the TEC, if you have been present enough, if you have time to know about everything because it is time consuming, uh, then you are invited to be a steward because you're this connector piece. You're someone that if anyone comes with a question, you would know how to answer or how to point them out to the right direction. So that's the definition of a steward. And then, and then coming out of the steward role would be like, oh, I'm not in the know anymore. So, so maybe I shouldn't um, hold this, this role or continue to try energizing this. And this is a self-reflection for, for everyone. And then the other role is contributors is, um, I'm joining this community. I want to contribute. I have a uh, specific time and skills, and I want to do. Uh, I want to have focused commitments. Um, and then subject matter experts that are uh, people that have like uh, a very specific expertise that without them we wouldn't be able to do uh, something. So. For example, in the legal group, we needed subject matter experts. Uh, the big subject matter experts of the TEC are the token engineers. Uh, they will always be um, uh, look, they are always gonna be the people that will offer advice for token engineering decisions and strategies. And, and they, they hold this role. Uh, and then uh, Gravitons that are the, um, conflict mediators trained by the Graviton training that have the capacity to uh, bring harmony to the community by the processes created by gravity. So just want to quickly open and see if anyone has reflections, objections about these roles, if there is a common understanding or um, other suggestions. So um, 
just to clarify, are you proposing that there are three different types of roles, the, the subject matter experts, the uh, stewards, and the contributors? Yeah, four and the gravitons. I mean, that has been uh, kind of the structure we've been following yep. already, and I think the, yeah. Sorry, w w would you not consider uh, gravitons to be subject matter, matter ex experts in that sense? Uh, well, I, I, Olivia, <laughs> unmute, mute. Um, I, I think it's a special, uh, it's, it's special enough to, to have its own thing. Um, also for marketing purposes, like making sure gravitons, there's awareness that gravitons are special. So I think, but I actually want to add something else. I feel like there's also a, a fourth category or fifth category of working group leads. Uh, and this, like, you have to be a steward to be a working group lead, but not all stewards are leading working groups, and that's okay, you know. Like, but like, working group leads have like certain responsibilities and or need to like, you know, connect with each other once in a while to make sure that the flock that, that like everything that everything's harmonizing nicely, uh, and they have even though they're part of the, a, a subset completely within the stewards group, uh, I feel like it is an, another piece. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to add to that too. Um, as we are growing and we have a lot of stewards, um, we're finding that um, there's a need for coordination between working group leads in like sprint planning and doing these things um, that maybe not all stewards have to participate to. So trying to find the distinction between, um, you know, the, the roles and responsibilities for in particular working group leads as opposed to like all the stewards. So they can be clearly defined and we could, we could have uh, clearly defined boundaries. And I think in the conversations, you know, around like, how to how to like what is the path of a contributor i also think comes into play you know from being a contributor to somebody like that's super active and like be painful to to, to have leave the the community um and then to being a steward in the community and and then maybe eventually also a working group lead or to go from a working group lead to being a steward to being active you know somewhere else in some other capacity so yeah, I, I really like that this is starting to take a, a lot more shape. And I think we're going to continue to grow. And um, I think that there's a possibility that we have a lot of people in the know. We have actually have a lot of stewards because uh, there's so many people in our community that are really passionate about being active. And yeah, so somehow being able to make sure we can scale the uh, the coordination as well as the group. Yeah, um, I think this is something that's been on my mind for a while now, because um, uh, uh, I, I do like having the roles aspect of it. Um, but in, and as we get larger and, the, and more people start to participate, I, I like to think of roles as kind of just individuals with unique abilities uh, within the TEC, whether it's, you know, uh, a particular function, whether it's uh, your Graviton or maybe you're in the comms and you're just, an, you know, you, you focus on editing. Like if you're an editor, that, that, that could be a, a kind of a sub ability that you have as a contributor um, and, and ways to categorize the, the functions that we have within our working groups to say, you know, instead of one person being relied upon to do this task, we have a, a entire group of people who are allowed to create their own institutions and processes and, and, and have their common interests kind of uh, facilitate that type of organizational task uh, as a collective, uh, instead of having, you know, one person who's constantly, you know, being overwhelmed or overburdened by something that you have a, a group of people with a, a special capabilities that that are able to go into whatever task that may be needed and say, hey, I can do this. I have the time to do this. Um, and so uh, just trying to figure out a system for that. 
Yeah, I think the more we um, talk about these things and add a self-reflection of how, what role do you think you occupy, and then having a com open communication about this with the people that are around you and that you think that also occupy certain roles and then start talking more openly about this. And, and the same for, oh, I feel like I'm no, no longer occupying this role and, and also having open communication. And, and then from this, um, having a, the coordination happens, like, like Tam said, it's quite challenging and um, and maybe we, we need to start thinking about separating certain groups. Like, like if we divide the community stewards between working group leads and um, stewards that are not leading working groups, perhaps we can have two separate calls, two separate groups that would give more time and space for people to express what they're observing from the community, what they're doing, what they can add, and then having other moments to have this link between them. I mean, we'll get, we'll have to uh, start experimenting as we grow. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we notice in our, you know, in our uh, weekly sync, or the community stewards weekly sync, is that um, we want to give time to do the temperature temperature check. And you know how the beginning of this call is always so intimate because we have this intro question. That so so there's something compelling about having the stewards meeting have that tone, and the uh, working group leads having that like, okay, now let's execute. Like, what is our what is our Zen hub? What does our sprint look like? What are, what are we tracking against the sprint? Do we have any blockers? Let's do a review. So there might actually add a much more of like an, um, uh, uh, what is, what's the word I'm looking for? Like additional cohesion between the stewards because of the closeness that we develop through having a different tone in our meeting and a different purpose of the meeting than executing against our, our uh, sprint plans and our sprint boards. It's, it's, it's something that I'm thinking a lot about now, actually, of course, as we have um, a lot of discussions, too. Can I add to that? Can you hear me OK? Um, so some of you, uh, I might have shown uh, that I'm working on this uh, thing called Virtuous Cycles. And Tam, I'd be really interested to hear what your perspective on this would be. I could send you the material that I have so far. But uh, one of the things that I noticed about um, when I was writing up this virtual cycle stuff was that um, uh, that there was uh, three sort of basic um, structures in the in the daily work, and one of uh, one of those structures was um, that there's kind of a uh, if I'm working on a, a daily schedule, it would be there'd be something about grounding and orienting, um, another about expressing and contributing, and then another is about sort of rest and digest um, and, and or getting inspired. So it could be that uh, it would make some sense to uh, arrange what you're talking about thematically. Uh, I'd like to have a separate discussion with you about that and see if what I'm talking about would make any sense in terms of um, orienting uh, sprints on, on some of these things. Um, but uh, I've got a bunch of graphics uh, behind it. So maybe we could have a separate meeting about that. Yeah, with pleasure. With pleasure. So we have um, we have just a few minutes before the top of the hour. I want to leave three minutes to talk about the mission, vision, and values, and have a ten-second round um, to challenge ten seconds to say what role do you think you occupy now, and what role. Would you like, are you satisfied with the role you're occupying? Uh, do you feel like it's too much or too little? Or is there anything else that you're looking towards, but in a, in a brief uh, way? So I'm, I'm occupying the role of community steward and, um, and I think I'm a contributor of other working groups sometimes, so jumping into that role in and out. And um, and I'm potentially a graviton, 
but I haven't involved myself fully in the process yet that is uh, starting. And I'll pass to. I think you muted early, but I'll take it because I don't know. Because I, I want to say some. I think it's like a really weird Venn diagram where everybody's a contributor. And then it, within that, there's like uh, subject matter experts with a Venn diagram that's with like, with, um, well, maybe the subject matter experts is a, is a Venn diagram with contributors. And then uh, within that, there's, there's like at that interface, there's like community stewards and gravitons. And uh, and within the community stewards group, there's the the working group leads, and I'm like in the middle of all of those things. I think I'm hitting every single thing because I'm all in. Uh, I'll pass it to Juan. Um, well, I think uh, that I am a steward, a contributor of other groups, and a graviton. And um, I will pass to Tamara. OK. Um, I think I contribute in a lot of places as well. I mean, anywhere I can help, I do. If I could eke out another 30 minutes out of my day to continue to help, I would. Um, I'd say, so primarily in the TEC, the, the community steward as well. Really, my in the community stewards working group, my focus is ensuring that we have like an optimal, um, you know, coordination between all of the working groups, so that we can reach our goals together. Um, so that we should we share interdependencies, and we can, as a team, remove blockers that are blocking one group or or multiple groups. And then, you know, and as as that role, I also think I, um, you know, I think a lot about how, uh, especially lately, we've been onboarding people or maybe how uh, it's been very organic and it's worked to now, but there's ways that we can improve it. So I would say, um, you know, my experience, I have a lot of experience as a consultant. So I'm used to just going into, uh, I'm used to providing, I would say like guidance and processes for organizations to, to optimize their workflows. So I'd say, at, uh, and that perspective, like under SoftGov, like my role would be like helping onboarding and um, bringing Katie in to sort of be the onboarding coordinator to help us strengthen those processes as well. And um, under the uh, Hatcher Hatcher uh, outreach team, I would say it's leading the hatch team right now and making sure that we're consistently onboarding new hatchers because we can't have a hatch without hatchers. So uh, very active in, you know, putting together, um, I'm, I'm over time. I'm going to pass to somebody else. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just feel like <laughs> no, you're going to just gonna pass to Mateo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just going to say that uh, let's try to just name the roles. And, and if we feel the necessity of moving between one role or another that we're not yet or that we are and we, we didn't want to be. So uh, Mateo. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I'm totally a graviton and a contributor, and I wish I had more time to come to all the meetings and offer my value to other working groups. But so far, yeah, I'm totally the source for the guy <laughs> contributor, and we can see all, all of that stuff that we have done so far. But yeah, I wish that the days had like 30 hours instead of 24, and we had more time to do more. But yeah, contributor, I'll pass it to Santi. Thanks, Mateo. <clears throat> I'm a, a steward of the legal working group, which was born from SoftGov a while ago. And I'm also a contributor of Steel's contributor of SoftGov and, and other and other groups. And I just like getting involved in different things, not just not just the group I'm leading. Uh, I'll pass it to Jake. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jake. Well, I honestly hate the term like like hey son what are you up to these days well dad i heard cats oh you sure you don't want to go back to drilling oil wells no i like herding cats uh and then my sister's like what do you do i was like i heard cats and she's like oh so are you like joe exotic and that was her joke and i was like yeah i'm a gay redneck thank you i'm herding cats in Oklahoma. sounds fantastic uh 
No, but uh, yeah, I just do it a tech param. Um, I don't know. I kind of do other things too, but I'm really not. Oh, comms, onboarding. Uh, I got out of a lot of that. I do a little bit though, but Prams is pretty much my little home. Um, somebody's got to herd these cats. I will say that I will never financially re this. I did it! I got it out there. Anyways, that's a meme from Joe Exotic. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Livia. I, I, yeah, my role. Uh, I, I'm the Prams guy. That's what I do. Okay, I'll give pass it back to uh, Chewy. Thank you, Jake. Um, well, um, uh, as, as as many of you uh, already know, I'm um, I'm trying to uh, uh, get a hold of, of of what goes on in in, in comms. Um, however, um, I'm I'm as 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 you were saying, Tam, I I I'm just having a hard time like trying to. Uh, be be like selective of of where I put my energy because everything is so so exciting and uh, I'd like to get involved more in gravity. I think uh, uh, it offers for me a lot of skills that I personally think I'm 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 missing and I could work on. Uh, and especially because uh, as as uh, being in comms and having a general level of 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 what goes on in in everything. Um, uh, I think that these tools are are very important. So I'll I'll try to get the most out of everything, but uh, I also want to work hard in in trying to uh, get some some people uh, close to the community. I can say I'm lucky enough to know uh, uh, a lot of like talented people and good and and at what they are. So I'll try to reach out to them and and you know try to get uh some, try to output some of that energy, like uh, knowing that eventually everyone here. Uh, knows how to like land in, in, in whatever they're good and what they can contribute. So, um, yeah, I'll pass it to, uh, Suga. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I'll be quick. I'm, I'm a newbie and I'm, um, onboarding coordinator for new, very new role. And I, I do, uh, anticipate and hope to have, um, numerous roles like all of you in the in the future and now i will pass it on i don't know how y'all keep track of who has spoken or not i need some kind of tool for that um so <laughs> we have so um, yes, pass it back to Lisa. thank you <laughs> thanks uh we're on the top of the hour so if anyone needs to leave uh feel free and thanks for coming and i'll pass for zap to miss to zap thanks Libby. Uh, I'm actually a, a steward, but I feel like I have a role. Like I'm like pretty supporting. Like uh, like since I'm doing all the recordings, I'm watching all the boards, and when I see some easy issues, I can help. Like yeah, I'm on it. I, I think I'm I actually contributed to all the working groups. Maybe not uh, Hadjas or Rich, but on the other ones, I I'm pretty sure I did smaller contributions and all of them. And I really love this role. Yeah, and I'll pass it back to you, Libby. And we're missing Nate. Yeah, uh, I think I'm the newest steward. Um, uh, I'm kind of a, a generalist, a contributor to both uh, SoftGov and comms. Um, but yeah, I kind of just dabble in each working group, uh, ranging from transparency to Omega. So um, yeah, and I will pass it to Durgadox. I'm a contextualizing catalyst pirate. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, one, one quick uh, note is please go to token log. It's in the, it's in the agenda. You can find the link um, here. I'll make it bigger. Vision, mission, values, hack session. That was one of the objectives for this agenda, but we didn't get there. So. Please uh, read the post if you haven't yet and make a proposal. It's super quick. What do you want for the mission, the values uh, and the vision of the TC? This is an amazing moment. Uh, yeah, Griff, go ahead. 
And if you want to, any inspiration, Zargam just published a blog post on the TEC blog, uh, Ethics and Engineering, and it might inspire you to think about the TEC. I also put, I put the- Please use token. And, yeah, and, and as Jake said, please use token luck. But the focus now is just proposing mission, vision, and value. So you can vote on it too, but like, um, yeah. Thank you guys.